Hello and welcome. Today we're going to see a brief video on an introduction to industrial design history and I hope you all enjoy it. So to uh, mark the starting point of, of industrial design we need to first uh, think a bit about um, objects, uh, man-made objects and, and their history throughout time. So for that let's uh, think a bit about this kind of objects. Well, it doesn't matter if they are primitive or more complex what they all have in mind is that objects used to be made by artisans. So, un made by an artisan, made that someone was not just in charge of building the object, but also of deciding how it should be. So, this uh, form, shape, and function of the object depended, um, or it was related to the, both the skills and the tools available for that artisan. And that was the case pretty much for, for a long time, but uh, at one point in time, that, that change in that moment was the 18th century in a very important process called the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was, as you might know, a process taking place first in England, but then throughout Europe and eventually the world that radically changed the way we make stuff, the way we produce things, and then we start to see a shift for um, objects being designed by someone and built by someone else, and that's where we see what we can call the beginning of, of industrial design as such. And a very important date on this, on, this, uh, on this history is 1851, and precisely because at that specific year there was an exposition in London, the, wor the World Exposition, in, in 1851 where objects from all around the world were displayed to be compared with the British industry and on this exposition and this and this fair we can start to see a shift in the way objects are uh, look and in, in the way they are produced so for instance if we focus a little bit on this one on the left here it's a piece of furniture made in the UK and you can see that it has like all this all this aesthetic uh, figures, all these ornaments that in a way relate or, or refer to a previous artisan made objects. And what's funny is that even though objects, even though these objects look like they were made by artisans, on many many cases this object used uh, industrial production. So these objects looked like they were made by artisans, but still they, they were actually uh, industrially produced and on many occasions mass produced. But on this fair we can we start to see objects that are specifically suited for mass production, for, for industrial productions. For instance, this uh, sewing machine from Singer, from a US manufacturer, it's obviously uh, ready or, or better said it, it, it was designed to be produced on a, an industrial level so you have all these straight planes the ornament it's now just a graphic that's supplied on top of the wood you have gearings and all of that so obviously this object over here is it's made to be it was designed to be produced industrially whereas this one on the left was not and all this discussion on on industrial production on, and craftsmanship, it, it does n it's not just a thing about style or engineering, it was for many people also a political or a philosophical thing. So if we move a bit forward to the, I'm sorry, to 1870s, we have this fellow over here called William Morris, and he was not just a designer, but also an architect, a writer, and a businessman. And he, along with other people, argued that um industrial revolution not just brought a progress and 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 uh, scientific um marvels to the world but also created uh despair and horrible living conditions for for many many people at that time and in 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 a way mass produced objects or industrially produced objects were seen as 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 guilty of of that of that um decrease or, or of that problem with, with the, the living conditions of, of, of people in England at that time. 
So his company, Morris.co, and, and the movement that they created that was called Arts and Craft, um, Arts and Craft, created objects like this piece that this like this wallpaper or, or this piece of furniture that were uh, built using um, craftsmanship and, and handmade production in a way uh, opposed to mass production and 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 what they see as a, a new world order or a new production uh, a new way of producing things that uh, was in a way taking hum humanity out of out of human beings and 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 as we progress along time, we, we get into 19th century, more specifically close to 1905, and we get across the pond to Austria, more specifically to Vienna, and that's where this company comes from, the Vienna Werkstatt. I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm pronouncing it wrong. I'm, I have no idea of German, but that, that can be loosely translated to Vienna's workshops and this uh, company used or, or was uh, used the help of designer like this uh, man over here Joseph Hoffman and they produce a set of objects that were very significant at that time because um, they represent an aesthetic uh, search for something different to move away from the ornaments of the past to this past to this old look of, of things so they created this kind of object that looked very modern very um, geometric and without any link to to its historic past so for instance this what's interesting is that this basket over here the all, like all many of these objects they look like very um, modern and they look machine built but they are actually hand built or or, or built with the help of machines but on a very low scale so they were actually luxury items so they were important not because they were massive but because of its significance in 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 time and in for times to come they will be seen as a lighthouse to for the uh, the look of aesthetic qualities that would be uh coming in the next years and so as we progress uh, a long time, we, we get also closer and closer to World War I, and we see one of the most important design um, movements of the time. It was called Art Nouveau, and that will be, sorry, Art Nouveau, and that will be New Art in French. And what's interesting about Art Nouveau is that it had local expressions or local chapters on many, many countries. So, for instance, you would have Macintosh and all his geometric um, inspiration in, in Scotland. One of the most prolific ones happened in Belgium and France. And it has inspiration on, on, on biological themes. In Germany, you had the Jugendstil, like this one over here. In Italy, we have Liberty as a local expression of Art Nouveau. And last but not least, around Barcelona and Catalonia and in Spain, you have modernism. So they were all different flavors, all different expressions of Art Nouveau happening at the same time on different regions and countries of Europe. And as we uh, get to we get to World War I, uh, there's another battle going on. In this case, it's uh, taking place in Germany also, but on an association called the Deutsche Werkbund. Again, sorry for my German. This was an organization of artists, of designers and industrialists for the advancement of the German industry. And this uh, battle was, um, was happening between two groups. The first one over here, whose main, one of the main proponents was this uh, guy over here called Henry van de Velde. And he was a Belgian um, architect, and he was a proponent of Art Nouveau. But more importantly, he was for the individuality duality of the artist, and that that means in in terms of uh, for for industrial designers, that means using industrial design or industrially produced objects as a mean of expression 
for, for artists. So they will defend his uh, own view of the world from, from, from the world of objects. And on the other hand, we have a group of, of designers, um, maybe not headed, but one of his main proponents was Peter Behrens, and he was, was this German also, and he worked for a company called AEG, or he collaborated with this company called AEG, and he's considered to be the first modern industrial designer. And, and this is very interesting because he not just created objects, but he also created architecture or uh, corporate identity for AEG. He created many things. It was a very, very interesting collaboration. And in terms of, um, of the design uh, thinking or, or the, the, the theory of design, he was for standardization. And this was the main battle going on in, in the Deutsche Werkbund. Those who were for standardization and those who were for the individuality of the artist. And indeed, standardization in terms of industrial design means designing for the industry and designing for sharing common parts and using alternatives to create new products. It's basically designing design for the industry. That will allow you to have a a higher output in terms of, of different models and types and it will allow a company to have a better uh, a better performance in the market by offering a broader a broader um, offering in in terms of, of production and so between these two groups uh, what happened is that this one looked much more appealing to the German industry so they had a lot of support from there and this group eventually won won the battle over there and this would eventually lead to the creation in 1919 of the Bauhaus school in Germany and that will be the beginning of our next chapter. Thank you very much and I hope you liked it. Bye-bye.